All right, yeah, also thank you very much for coming, the people who are in, in person and everybody online. So we'll start the first hour with a virtual event that everybody also can join over Zoom. And today we have a panel discussion about medical simulation for training using mixed reality. We have here two people in person, um, Tom Caruso and Albert Tsai. You will see them soon when they give the introduction on the screen. And online, David Gaba and Martin Ismaman. And uh, first, everybody will give, like in the previous meetings, we'll give a five minute introduction about their background, about what they're doing and uh, the work they're performing. Oh, we also have, wait, is he already inside? Yes, sorry, Patrick. Patrick Shironoshta from uh, Magic Leap is also here. Great, uh, we hadn't talked uh, this morning. Glad that you, that you also made it. Um, about the in-person event, so the in-person event, uh, just quick introduction. After we are done here with the panel discussion at 10, we'll have a 15 minute mixer where people can ask the panelists any questions via Zoom. And from then on, we'll switch to the offline version. So we'll have students showing demos in person in the room. And um, here you won't come here so that people actually also online hear you and see you. And one word also by Bruce Daniel. Hi, Bruce Daniel. Um, just thank you all for coming. One word about the demonstrations. We're hoping to have one of our postdocs go around with her phone camera on the same Zoom and be able to show, show some of the demos to those of you who are watching uh, virtually as well too. So that'll be a first for us to try. Please forgive us if it doesn't work, but at least we can give it a go, so. Exactly, so, so if you want, please stay online and you might be able to see some of the demos. But then for the time being, I want to start uh, today's panel discussion and I won't give too long introductions to don't take so much time away from the panel. And um, all the panelists will introduce themselves during that time. So please, if we first start with Tom Caruso and then followed by Albert, yeah. Are we doing our slides now? Exactly, we're doing okay. our slides, we're all shared. Hi guys, um, thank you so much for having us. While uh, Christoph pulls up our slides, I will um, begin with introductions. My name is Tom Caruso. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist at uh, Stanford Children's Hospital. And I um, help run the Stanford Chariot Program with a couple of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sam Rodriguez, Dr. Ellen Wang, who um, are not represented here today, but are key members of that team. And we have... Get myself in the picture. Good morning, everybody. My name is Albert. I, I apologize. My speech is going to be a little bit limited. I'm still getting over cold, uh, but it's not what you think. Uh, I am an adult uh, cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, and I collaborate with Tom uh, in some of our simulation studies that you will be seeing uh, in a few minutes. So we're excited to show you what we are working on. I'm going to keep it on just for my not that brave, but um, Tom's gonna get us started and I will catch you guys in a couple minutes towards the end. Thank you so much, Albert. Um, it's been really a joy to collaborate with Albert on these projects. And uh, that's something that we really wanna make a main, uh, main take home point from this lecture is that the Stanford Chariot Program, um, you know, similar, similar to Christoph and uh, Dr. Daniel's group is collaboration is really key to moving the uh, science uh, and technology forward. Um, what is the Stanford Chariot Program? It originally stood for Childhood Anxiety Reduction Through Innovation and Technology when we first started this uh, several years back. Um, since then, we then moved into pain relief. Um, we started to work more with adults. We've added educational components, which is what we're going to talk about today. So now the acronym doesn't really um, tell the whole story anymore, but we still go by the Stanford Chariot Program. It's easier than changing the name. And we couldn't come up with an acronym any better. Um, we have four main uh, pillars at the Stanford Chariot Program. One is a pretty active research component. Um, most of our research is clinical. Uh, second is software development. We develop um, not all of our software, but almost all of our software uh, out of our lab. Uh, we have found that um, by developing software that is inherently tied to the needs of educators and clinicians in the hospital, we're able to develop uh, technologies that really um, fit the solution set that we're looking for as opposed to pulling off the shelf content and trying to modify it for our needs. 
Um, third, we develop clinical programs. Not everything we do is um, studied and for research. We actually provide uh, clinical protocols for Lucille Packard's Children's Hospital where we use um, our technologies, not just for anxiolysis and analgesia, but also for um, uh, faculty and healthcare personnel education on how to better care for uh, children and patients. And um, last pillar here we have is hardware modification. Um, it's getting better, um, particularly with some of the new devices out there. But when we were first starting, most of the devices that were consumer uh, grade were not ready for the hospital environment. So that meant, um, you know, taking off straps and 3D printing and customizing different straps that would not have uh, fabric, uh, new face pads that did not have fabric, uh, all things necessary to ensure the safety of our users. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. Um, we are technologically uh, relatively agnostic. We use mobile VR headsets quite extensively, um, smart projectors, room scale VR, and augmented and uh, mixed realities. Um, we find that we have a wide variety of users, whether they be children, faculty, or, or um, uh, other healthcare personnel. And given the the need, whether it be educationally related or clinically related, um, and given the patient population or personnel, different hardware will fit that need better. Just to talk a little bit about mixed reality, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Sai. He's um, been helping with um, sort of the, the, the development and um, research around one of our mixed reality projects. Um, Although Dr. Sai is here with us today, I, I want to make sure that, you know, Dr. Ellen Wang, Dr. Sam Rodriguez, the rest of the Stanford Chariot crew who I'm representing today understands that, you know, obviously this is a big group effort. I right, let Dr. Sai take this over and talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of mixed reality and a little bit about a, a little research project he recently completed. Thank you, Tom. So just to give you a little uh, bit of a background, I spend most of my time, if not in the OR, just kind of teaching residents and fellows. And it's a big part of what I enjoy about my work. When the pandemic started a year and a half ago, we essentially converted everything virtually. So all the stuff I love to do in person, uh, in-person instructions, workshops, got converted to Zoom. And after a year of just doing PowerPoints after PowerPoints, I started thinking about what if there's another way to deliver um, uh, education experiences in a more interactive way. So I actually started looking around online and I started an educational project, got some time to explore what I wanted to do. I pulled up a YouTube video and I saw him at a TED, um, a TED talk, TEDx, MedX, some, some sort of a symposium. Maybe a med, med talk, not TED talk. Med, med talk. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool. So they were using essentially virtual and augmented reality to treat anxiety in kids. So I, I hit up Tom and we decided to do a, a study on the potential of using AR technology uh, in delivering a simulation. So when you look at this slide, what are some of the potential advantages to mixed reality that may be uh, uh, advantageous in this age of kind of virtual learning? So, the, so what I wanna uh, kind of focus on is, is this portability part. When you are trying to get residents and fellows out of the OR for simulation, it's uh, a logistical nightmare uh, from the operating room standpoint. So if you can actually produce an experience that you can carry anywhere in the hospital with you and actually deliver them uh, within you know, 15, 20 minutes, they can come down during their lunch breaks, do a simulation and go back to work. Uh, that is an advantage that uh, this technology offers. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the other advantages that we have found as we kind of went through the study as well. Now, some of the uh, potential negatives of mixed reality technology is uh, the upfront cost. So each headset that we provide for the participants, uh, am I allowed to say how much they are? Yeah. Okay. It costs about $2,000 for each, for each set headset. So if you want to have a simulation where there is three or four or five participants, that's $10,000 right there just to get the equipment. However, the advantage of that, um, the upfront cost is there's very little maintenance cost afterwards. So, so aside from just kind of software development, 
you don't have to do a whole lot in terms of maintaining equipment. You don't have to hire additional uh, uh, workers or uh, instructors to kind of maintain and, and run the simulations. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about some of the negatives as we go on as well. So what do we do? So we asked a very qu a simple question. Is AR technology a feasible adjunct or supplement to traditional in-person simulation? So I found 18 of my cardiac anesthesia colleagues, uh, residents and fellows, and I put them through an intraoperative cardiac arrest simulation. And we'll see a video of that in a second. And what we did after the simulations, we sat them down and did a structured interview and uh, performed thematic analysis to essentially uh, try to figure out what the global impression of these experiences were. So we took something that was uh, initially meant to be done clinically for kids uh, to reduce their anxiety when they're hospital and we converted to uh, a simulation session that looks something like this. And I'm gonna show you a video to, uh, to kind of just kind of go through what that actually looks like. And there shouldn't be any sound because we kind of just want to uh, narrow it through it, over it. Perfect. So there's no sound for this uh, because Tom and I just want to kind of uh, narrow it through it. This is uh, essentially set up shop in the basement of the Children's Hospital. And you can see that everyone's wearing headsets, but there's also physical objects like a mannequin that we are doing chest compressions on. So we're gonna uh, fast forward to a view of what the participant is seeing in the upper right-hand corner. What you're seeing here in the upper right corner box is what the instructor is seeing. So you can see a whole host of menus. So things like, let's make a breathing tube appear. Let's shock the patient. Let's make the blood pressure go down, the heart rate go up. So this is something that the instructor can see and essentially a change as the participants uh, make clinical decisions throughout the simulation. And this is just uh, some more views of what that looks like. So you can see that we are actually able to bring physical equipment like you see this ultrasound machine that Tom has next to him. And we are able to incorporate that into our simulation. So this does offer quite a bit of flexibility. You have essentially, if you are re resource limited and you don't have all the physical equipment, you can still run the simulation just with holographic projections. However, if you're in a hospital setting where you are have read readily accessible equipment such as, as ultrasound and mannequins, you can incorporate that into your augmented reality simulation so they can get some tactile feedback uh, when they are uh, participating in these simulations. So with that, we'll close. I'm sure we took more than our 10 minutes or seven minutes, um, but there's two of us, so we get double. And um, we'll pass it back off over to Christoph. Thank you very much. Yeah, you basically took all the questions that I'm going to ask you later already <laughs> in your introduction. That was a, a great introduction to medical simulation. Now I'm, we'll switch over to the guests. So first, David, if you want to perhaps share a screen, please. Perfect. Almost perfect. There we go. Okay, so thank you very much. This is a, a great uh, thing you've convened and uh, and bringing together a lot of uh, different uh, individuals and, and groups. Oops. Um, anyway, I'm uh, David Gaba. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and I'm the associate dean for immersive and simulation-based learning at Stanford. I'm a founding board member of the Primary Simulation Professional Society, the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, and I was its founding and 12-year editor-in-chief of the first peer-reviewed and PubMed index simulation journal, Simulation in Healthcare. Um, I've got 36 years of pioneering experience in, um, gee, why am my slides changing? Well, um, I've been doing this a long time. And one thing I like to emphasize is that simulation is a technique, not a technology. Um, I'm responsible for independently reinventing the technology of the computerized mannequin simulators uh, going back to 1986 and 
through now. Uh, first to develop and conduct simulation training based on aviation's crew resource management uh, in the healthcare starting in 1990. I've uh, personally created and direct, directed and direct uh, two dedicated simulation centers uh, since 1995 at VA Palo Alto, where now we have a 9,000 square foot facility. And since 2010 at Stanford, uh, where we have a 28,000 square foot uh, simulation facility. And these centers and centers like this have multiple user groups and a, a variety of modalities of simulation. Uh, other things we do are mentor people doing in situ simulation taking place at actual bedsides or in the actual work units in uh, the hospitals. Um, so, the spectrum of modalities and applications of simulation is very large. And now over the, the last 30 some odd years or so, there are already some pretty good theoretical paradigms uh, about the different aspects and levels of realism or, or uh, other characteristics uh, that are relevant to simulation. I've written about uh, an 11 dimensional space of simulation characteristics and each of those dimensions has its own spectrum. And the, the variety of the things in the 11 dimensional space, I can't go through them all, but a lot of them, a number of them distill down into the who, what, why, where, and how uh, of the particular uh, undertaking or activity that's being talked about. And um, even if there's only four or five parts to the spectrum of any given dimension, that would be four or five. If they were all independent, that would be four or five to the 11th power, which is a big, huge number of, uh, of combinations. So in simulation, already we have many different modalities of simulation from the no technology at all, like verbal simulation, role play, use of actors, uh, physical, technologies involving cadavers, as we'll hear more about um, from Martin, uh, computerized mannequins, uh, procedural trainers, and then to virtual um, systems like was just described by, by uh, uh, the chariot team and uh, I'll briefly uh, mention as well. And the VR and AR, I sort of, uh, categorized in the two bundles. One is things dealing only with visualization, say for anatomy and, and so forth, and then things uh, allowing and, and uh, encouraging uh, full interaction. And all the different modalities of simulation are considered complementary. It's not like any one is, is better than the other. And hybrids between them are also very common. So that's kind of where we stand in the VR, AR mixed reality, I think fits in very well in, in this set of spectra. So my own experience with VR, AR kinds of simulation uh, that don't include anything that's purely visualization because we've, uh, the, the people in the anatomy division are heavily involved in things like that. Um, I'm actually in print in a couple of places from the 1990s to the 2000s, predicting that VR would fully take over from physical simulation by, <coughs> excuse me, by 2020 or 2025. Obviously, we're not there to the former, and I don't think we're going to be there for uh, even in four more years, but we'll see. Uh, and at Stanford in, in our Immersive Learning Center, we, uh, we did a few years of evaluation of virtual reality gear and applications for healthcare, and we ended up purchasing a system from a company called Simex that allowed multi-participant head-mounted display VR simulations. And uh, I'm not I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but one of the things I wanted to do was, which I did, was commission three departments to each develop a scenario that would be difficult or impossible to conduct physically. 
So as we'll see, uh, the emergency department people had a scenario with a journalist uh, helicopter to Everest Base Camp who developed high altitude sickness of significant severity. <clears throat> My anesthesia colleagues developed a scenario with a, a drape fire in the operating room involving the face of the patient, possibly their airway. The hospitalists developed a, a scenario about a patient with the alcohol withdrawal and delirium tremens, something I treated a lot when I was an intern, but I haven't seen for many, many, many years. Um, <clears throat> And okay, and now my slides won't change. Well, so the only things remaining were a, a couple of uh, pictures of uh, the uh, Everest base camp scenario and the uh, anesthesia scenario, but that's okay. I don't really need to show them. And um, the final thing I, I uh, want to raise is uh, that I think this whole arena of virtual augmented mixed reality uh, simulation is going to go through many, many different uh, changes in the next five to 10 years across all different categories of change from the technologies, the business models, the the pedagogy, the applications, um, how they're combined in hybrids and so forth. And um, there are a huge number of questions about where uh, these, uh, these modalities fit relative to the whole, uh, the whole uh, set of different modalities that can be used for simulation and how they can be used together best and where in different curricula for different uh, participant populations and different goals of simulation, um, these different kinds of modalities can best be used in, in, um, and combined. Now, <clears throat> my particular main interest because of my clinical background is in arenas of uh, highly dynamic, uh, intrinsically dangerous kinds of healthcare with uh, multi-disciplinary uh, teams that work together um, physically on a physical patient in uh, currently at any rate on a, in a actual single environment, uh, whether, whether the robots and the robots acting individually or as our avatars can replace that, we'll see someday, I suppose. But I'm really interested in things that uh, either are or can replicate those kinds of environments. And so my final slide is or would have been, uh, I think there are two key sets of milestones that I'm looking forward to seeing when we can meet them. And one is the ability to create a computer generated, fully believable um, uh, and fully interactive uh, simulated coworkers. Right now, if you need, if you want to do a, a team simulation, you have to have all the members of the team or actors playing members of the team to do that. Um, but it would be great if, for any one or more participants, you could have a whole, whole cast of coworkers as well as the simulated patient. And currently, we're not really anywhere near there. And uh, even with the the games that sort of try to approach that um, to the degree they can do that, it's only with the expenditure of huge amounts of money that um, simulation applied to healthcare uh, doesn't really have. And of course, the, the last milestone would be simulations that are so realistic in a variety of ways that they're nearly indistinguishable from real life, such as the Star Trek holodeck. And we don't know for which kinds of applications and activities. David, David, sorry, don't want to interrupt you too much. Just uh, that so we, we can later come to the panel discussion to some of these questions. If you can, like, give one last sentence for your introduction. And that then is, move to the that is what I'm up to. Uh, we don't know what we'll need that kind of simulation for, but it'll be great to see it happen sometime in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. There's a perfect example of 
this great mix between on the one hand we have the real world we need the real world and many things can actually be learned much better in the real world and then the virtual world that augments um, it on top of it and provides us additional capabilities so next uh, we want to switch to patrick shironoshta from magic leap and patrick you have the screen please for your introduction thank you and i hope it works thank you everybody um hmm. Of course, it's not going to work. Uh, give me just one second. I need to make sure that this can. Uh, oh, man. Um, OK. I hope this works. One second. Uh, my name is Patrick Shironoshita. I work for Magic Leap. I am director of. Uh, of digital health solutions and i need to allow zoom to share the screen give me just one second if you don't mind there you go um, i i have to reconnect okay so we'll start with martin and then yes, you'll please. go after martin and uh, once you're reconnected perfect thank you all right, and thank you very much. Um, so the next uh, introduction will be by Martin Ismaman from San Diego. So Martin, please, if you can give your introduction and share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for letting me participate in this wonderful panel. Let me uh, share my screen real fast. There we go. I think you should be able to see that. Um, my name is Commander Martin Ismaman. I am a Naval Medical Officer. Um, and a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist by training. I was a former Stanford uh, fellow in Albert's division. He was uh, one of my uh, attendings back then. And I now am serving as the program director for the anesthesiology residency program at the Naval Medical Center, San Diego. Um, I've deployed twice in support of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency missions in Afghanistan. I was asked to be on this panel to share some of my experiences with medical simulation and training um, that us Naval physicians go through prior to our deployment. So uh, I'll begin with a quick story. Uh, on the left there is a picture of me more than a decade ago as a general medical officer for 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. Um, it, that's an infantry battalion that I deployed with to Helmand Province, Afghanistan. I had essentially finished internship and at this point in my medical training um, and was just a general practitioner responsible for the medical care of 1400 Marines and sailors. On the right is a more recent picture of me uh, at the NATO Roll 3 Multinational Medical Unit at Kandahar Airfield as a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. Uh, I highlight these two pictures because they highlight a spectrum of medical care that we provide as part of combat casualty care. As a result of the care we provide by the young me and the older me, uh, along with hundreds of other military physicians, we can see that survivability from combat wounds have dramatically declined from the days of the war for American independence and the Civil War but even from more recent conflicts like the Persian Gulf War of the 1990s. Though some of the improvements in survivability can obviously be attributed to the advancement of medicine, uh, we can also attribute these improvements to our ability to maintain a ready medical force. But how do we do that? The Navy, as you can see, employs roughly 180 active duty anesthesiologists, about 230 general surgeons of varying subspecialties, and about 200 and other surgical specialties as well. Um, to complicate things, they're stationed throughout the country with only trauma centers, with the only trauma centers being Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, uh, which is a level one trauma center, and Naval Medical Center Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, which is a level two trauma center. So these certainly create a set of challenges to maintain the high level of effectiveness for our combat casualty care. Firstly, there's obviously a varying level of expertise. Going back to the first picture, old me certainly had more expertise than the young me who was straight out of internship. Uh, the same can be said for the level of expertise amongst the 180 or so anesthesiologists and 200 or so general surgeons. Along with the expertise is experience, especially experience in trauma medicine, transfusion, damage control surgery. Uh, then there's the team familiarity. When we deploy, we don't deploy as a unit from the same institution. Many of the units are made of from a combination of individuals from any of those sites I showed previously. Uh, learning to operate as a team in a stressful situation can prove to be really challenging sometimes. Um, there's new equipment. Our expeditionary equipment are different from those seen in a typical hospital. They're made to be portable and durable, not necessarily functional. 
Um, there are limited resources, and it goes without saying that operating in the field is completely different than operating in a large medical center with abundant supplies and support. When we have to carry all of our equipment and consumables, resources become a huge challenge. And of course, the unknowns, will I be operating in a ship, a commandeer building, the back of an ambulance, or even if, or a fixed hospital like, like I was in, at the NATO Rule 3? These are all the things that we sort of have to train for. To meet those challenges, the Navy stood up a partnership between the Naval Expeditionary Medical Training Institute and LA County USC Medical Center. There, every team deploying to a combat zone goes through real and simulated trauma training for a period of two weeks to two months. The goal of the training is to provide high fidelity simulation to facilitate basic knowledge acquisition, improve your decision making, and improve skill coordination, all of which relates to maintaining that level of expertise that I spoke about. Um, practice for rare and critical events to gain experience. Um, I would classify three extremity amputation as a rare event in normal life, but these are the things we do see in combat. Uh, learn how to work together in a controlled environment in order to prepare for a more stressful and potentially dangerous situation. Ooh, excuse me. Uh, lastly, to improve psychomotor skills, not just the typical skills associated with trauma surgery, but also to learn how to use the different equipment, especially in a stressful situation. So at LA County, uh, the teams are incorporated into the trauma call schedule to gain some real world experience in the so-called knife and gun club. Uh, however, the highlight of their training is the use of profuse cadavers to simulate trauma training. These cadavers allow the teams or allow for training of trauma evaluations, uh, line placement, airway management, uh, and damage control surgery. To add to the realism, they actually do bleed from their injuries like a normal human. The anatomy is what you would expect to see and their physiology can reflect uh, their injury pattern and your interventions as well. Essentially, they offer the most lifelike simulation of a trauma patient. Uh, the benefit of using these, knowledge acquisition, decision-making, obviously skill coordination and psychomotor abilities. What do we do next? Well, we take those skills and allow our teams to use them in a more realistic environment. Uh, at Kemp Pendleton in, South, in Southern California, we utilize surgical mannequins in scenarios that are more typical of the ones the teens will see during deployments. These mannequins do also bleed and allow you to operate on them as if they were real people. Um, the teams will operate in the field with only the equipment they can carry on their backs. Uh, they'll operate in moving vehicles. They'll even operate in the dark with minimal light and strict noise discipline. That's the picture through the lens of a, of a night vision goggle right there that I took with my iPhone. Um, the intent of this portion of their training is to focus more on their team dynamics in a more stressful situation and obviously to improve on those psychomotor motor skills uh, that may deteriorate when you're pushed physically and mentally to your limits. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of these training? I'm sure we'll talk more about this um, throughout the, the panel discussion. Um, Realism, we can realistically mimic the injury pattern that these surgical teams will see in theater. More importantly, we can mimic the environment and the stress that they'll potentially occur or encounter. Uh, rare occurrences, some of these injury patterns and severity are rarely encountered in the United States, but they're the most devastating injuries that we do see during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflict, or we did see. Um, and they help with not just individual skills, but also your ability to handle the env those environmental stressors. Disadvantages, they are expensive. Um, it's not just the up uh, upfront cost of buying the equipment, but obviously you have to purchase a new, uh, a new cadaver every single time. Um, there's always ethical concerns with using cadavers um, and they require expert trainers that can run the scenarios as realistically as possible. That's why the, the Navy sort of employs people like myself who've deployed to train the next group to go. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Christoph. This is the trauma team that I deployed with a couple of years ago, um, and I'll give it back to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this great introduction and uh, these super interesting images. And I, th I see Patrick is back. Patrick, can you try? I am um, back and I can on? try, and I think it will work this time, I hope. So yes, perfect. We see it. You're seeing my screen. There you go. Yes. Um, so, okay, so as I was saying, and this was just a trick to 
go last, I guess. Um, I am uh, I'm director of digital health solutions at uh, at Magic Leap. I've been in Magic Leap for about four years. Personally, I am uh, my background is in biomedical software development. I've been at it for a long time. In the last four years uh, at Magic Leap, I've always been working at the health business unit. Um, it is perhaps known or not that well known, but we've been working on health applications since the company was conceived uh, back in 2011. And, uh, and of course, there's a lot of about human physiology in the device itself. So, but we've also looked um, always at, at the applications in, in the health environment. Now, our platform, we, which we released in 2018, I guess I could, couldn't do it more justice than what uh, Tom and, and Albert did. So I won't dwell a lot, but there is, of course, the, the, the dimensions between virtual reality and then augmented reality, either using it, you know, like a tablet or phone versus uh, using an actual um, um, you know, head-mounted display like, like the one we have. So the Magic Leap one was a big leap in 2018. It does have... Uh, it does have a lot of virtues and a lot of revolutionary characteristics, I would say. And it is a quite a useful uh, device as, as I said, Tom and Albert just mentioned. And also, uh, I guess, Christoph has used it as well. And uh, a few other people that I can show at the end. Um, but uh, of course, it also, it also needs to evolve. So we are going towards our Magic Leap 2. It's gonna be launching next year. We have already shown pictures of the form factor, so this is not like secret. Uh, you can see it on our website. It is 50% uh, smaller uh, in terms of volume and 20% lighter. It actually sits very well in your in your head, if I may say so. Um, it also, you know, one little thing you, you can see it also goes straight on on your temples rather than that curved feature that we had in M01, and that is because the the weight. We, we can, because the, the device is lighter, we can distribute the weight better. It still has um, like an attached computer pack through that cable that you can see, but the cable we made significantly lighter and smaller as well. It is, uh, we'll say best in class device. The one thing that you have to see once you are able to get a demo or just get your hands on, a, on one of these devices is the doubling of the field of view. It's actually, you know, twice as large as Magic Leap 1. Um, so therefore twice as large as our main competitor as well. So that leads, leads to a lot of, of different uh, use cases that you can have. One other thing that I will highlight is we have a dimming facility so you can actually obscure the entire lens, not only the, the virtual field of view, but the entire field of view of the device, which means you can darken it close enough to true black and close enough to like eliminate uh, light coming from the outside. And, and this leads to better legibility, as well as a certain set of use cases that may, where you may prefer to be more immersive. Um, one other feature that I like to highlight all the time is a spatialized audio. It is already in, in M01, and it is a capability of, of you know, placing audio, well, audio sources where they come from, at least perceptually for the user. Um, here are the main ways in which we see we see the magic leap to uh, going into the field, and, and as applied to medical simulation, of course, there is the ability to do this in co-present ways. So not only not only all everybody in the same space, but with people remotely connected as well. Um, there is the ability to do visualizations in three dimensions, as as I think uh, again Tom and Albert showed better than I ever could. And uh, and one more thing is it you know all the communication capabilities together with the three D visualization capabilities really leads to uh, an augmented workforce or in this case augmented training or augmented simulation for for use cases like David or or uh, or Martin showed. Um, so this these are these are the the kinds of things that that we're aiming for now. As I said, we've been working on the on the health field for. Since well, since before I joined the company four years ago, um, and we see a range of applications. Right, it goes all the way from what you would see in a hospital setting, in the surgical side, like training for surgical training, training for for you know reactions by patients and things like that. Anything you see in the emergency room or the operating setting, um, and in in planning as well. Uh, but also in digital diagnostics and therapeutics, there is a number of use cases that don't involve necessarily the use of, of the device in, in, 
in, in the operating environment. And uh, those digital technologies, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics can easily be extended to like a fitness and sport performance um, area, right? So, so there is a, a large um, range of, of possibilities. And one of the other things I would say in terms of simulation, it is possible to simulate an operation or it's possible to simulate like uh, emergency treatment of a patient, but it is also possible to simulate a number of other conditions as well. The device does have a full complete perception stack as well as the visualization stack. And all of those are quite useful for, for things that are needed to be done. Um, okay, let me see. So as I said, this this an, another repeat, there is, a, there is a, a lot of things that can be do about teleconsulting and telehealth as well. And eventually, ultimately, the user at home. I know, I know it was highlighted that the cost of the device is, is higher, and it is true. Uh, but costs will go down in the future, and in the meantime, you know, certain use cases, sometimes it's invaluable, and no, no matter the cost, and also it's not that expensive either. So let me tell um, about a few use cases that we have. We've been partnering with uh, with Brain Lab, um, it's a neurosurgery software company uh, based in Germany uh, for years now, and they have, uh, for example, the ability to visualize in three dimensions reconstructed. Um, uh, radiological scan. So you essentially take MRIs, um, CTs, maybe angioplasties and a few others, and you put them together through specialized software that BrainUp does. And then once you have a 3D model before you could use a, a, a VR or AR device, you actually had to see it through, through a, in, in a 2D screen. But the ability to see it in 3D is significantly better, especially because if you think about it, surgeons think in 3D. This also goes to the same point about training, right? I mean, people think in 3D, so having 3D, uh, 3D, the ability to display 3D is, is quite important. A couple other use cases in the diagnostic side, we, we're partnering with a company called Hero about visual, uh, visual fields testing in general ophthalmology applications. And we're partnering with a company called SyncThing. It actually is uh, one of their, one of their, their main CMOs is, is in Stanford and we're, we're partnering with Stanford. Um, sports performance in, in doing some of this work is uh, about using eye movements to diagnose things like concussion and traumatic brain injury and a few other things like that. So eye tracking and eye analytics is actually quite an important part of what we can do. Um, finally, you already saw this. I don't, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I am going to say that I was trying to find a, a slide from Christoph, but I ran out of time. But uh, I know that uh, Immerse is also, you've also been using it for transcranial magnetic stimulation and a few other applications like that. Um, so with the ML2, we think these applications are gonna be even, even better for everybody. So that's it for me in, in terms of my intro. I hope uh, I was more or less on time, but Christoph, thanks. Yes, these were great introductions and they already covered a lot of the questions about mixed reality medical simulation. Then Albert and Tom, if you can please come to the front. And Lily, if you can please spotlight, I'm not sure whether spotlights are in everybody here so that you can feel a bit more interactive <laughs> with, with the rest of the panelists. So today's panel, it was actually, it was not on purpose to be honest, but it's great timing that this is the first panel after our last panel on haptics. So the last panel two months ago was with haptics with people from mechanical engineering and uh, contact CI, uh, like a haptic glove company. And you already covered that, like uh, you talked about medical simulation and it, it actually augments. It doesn't really replace, or from all of your introductions, it didn't seem like it replaces existing training techniques, but it augments them. It puts, uh, puts like additional content on top. So my first question would be um, to both of you, Tom and Albert, what are the things that are definitely much, much better using mixed reality? What are the, th what are the things that perhaps are not yet possible using the mixed reality medical simulation or that might be, um, or that might be never possible using um, these type of devices. Um, so much, much better in our current setup. And I can't speak for all possibilities out there, but currently if we want to do something called an in situ simulation, what we mean by in situ simulation is we are at work, we're in the operating rooms and we say, heck, we have some time between cases. Let's do a simulation right now. Um, 
if we want to do that in our current setup, we have this uh, kind of this cart that's got some mannequins hooked to it, some video cameras, some monitors that you can modulate. And there's quite a bit of setup that goes into rolling that into the operating room and setting it up before we've even started anything. Um, much better, in my opinion, has been using augmented reality um, with the trainer that we've developed in the insight choose situation. With just the uh, with the portability of an all in one headset, no other equipment is needed, and we can just roll right into that um, operating room, do an insight choose simulation, and walk out with uh, little to no setup. I know that um, with physical assets. Um, there are some more advanced um, equipment out there that's, that have been trying to continue to reduce that setup time. Um, but, you know, nothing really, I've not seen a, a really good replacement for something as simple as putting on a headset. Um, but, you know, the downside is, is that now we're dealing with holographic assets. And that gets into some of the questions um, that Dr. Gaba brought up earlier today is, at what point are is this simulation quote unquote real enough, right? Um, if we have a holographic asset of a, let's say a rapid blood uh, infuser or a holographic asset of let's say a, um, a defibrillator, um, one of the machines that will send shocks to the heart, is a holographic asset good enough or use it with a traditional insight to simulation, you might use a real, uh, a real, uh, defibrillator or a real rapid uh, infuser for blood products. Um, and those are the questions that we don't know yet. Um, so will, will it ever be as good? Perhaps. Um, but when? I'm not sure. Albert, do you want to add anything to that? Nope. Hello. So I think just to add to uh, what Tom was saying, I think one of the th limitations of uh, AR tech techniques is currently right now we're limited by our ability to provide haptics or touch, right? So if you don't have physical assets with you, if you're just doing purely holographic simulations and your learning objective is to pr um, learn procedures, for instance, it would be really hard for you to get that um, experience given the current limitations of the technology. So I think that is, that is why we uh, picked AR for our simulations because we have the option of overlaying physical environments with the simulated um, environments so we can provide uh, both uh, physical touch as well as holographic uh, kind of best of both worlds. And I think that's one, one way to get around it, but it's not always possible if you're in resource limited environments. Thank you very much. Um, David, David, you mentioned in one of your slides actually that you predicted, I believe in the 90s already, that VR will play a huge role in this field. So if you look at now uh, 2021, you, you probably haven't foreseen a pandemic, but uh, you might have foreseen some of the medical simulation um, technology aspects. At what stage are we right now with respect to your predictions and what hasn't been reached so far? Yeah, I think we're still at pretty early days on a lot of these things across all those characteristics of the the technologies, the applications, and and then the goals and and the pedagogy and so forth. Uh, one thing in relation to what was just being talked about, I'd like to mention is simulation is not just for training. Um, there's a lot of use of simulation in situ in in clinical settings uh, to do what I call system probing. Um, where you're trying to recreate, by doing in situ simulation, trying to recreate uh, challenging situations in the actual environment which takes place so that you can understand better what, what works well, what doesn't work so well. Um, and that's one where, uh, like so many things, we don't know yet how realistic would you have to make the, the holographic assets in their user interfaces so that you're really capturing the challenges that people find in, in real patient care. But I, I think what's great actually is that, um, you know, when I started writing in, in about the possibility of, of VR and AR and, and all these things, 
uh, it was really completely out of reach, except for maybe some military applications. Uh, NASA was using, you know, big head-mounted displays and stuff like that. And, uh, but, you know, it's taken longer than I think a lot of people thought it would uh, get down to the more consumer level. But I think it's a really exciting time where it is that that is happening and happened. And now it's the explosion of all the different parties and all the different kinds of activities that going to tell what really works well. Thank you very much. So if you're thinking about the technology that you need in order to get there, in order to get perhaps the visual realism where you say that it's not entirely clear yet, how realistic does it actually have to be for the perfect training experience? And um, Patrick, was some of the major feedback that you got, was it about the field of view and about the weight of the device or what other feedback did you get, did you get about um, the holographic development or like the, the magic leap development um, that is important for these kinds of applications? Certainly, the dream for everybody is to have something that's even lighter than your usual glasses that has all the compute power in the world and that has an infinite field of view. Uh, or at least as, as big a field of view as your own eyes. And that uh, you know, that is really a seamless experience. We are relatively far from that, but I think as an industry as a whole, not just Magic Leap, we've made a lot of strides towards, towards that objective. Um, I, I will say that short term, especially in the simulation, sim center kind of space, um, field of view is, is really, really important, right? I mean, when, when you have such too small of a field of view, you have, uh, it, it, it's just not natural enough, right? Even leaving out the haptics, which is also another, of course, big issue. But uh, in, 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 in the kind of technology we have, especially with augmented reality or X reality, you, you are able to work with, with physical objects as well as with virtual objects, which ones which and how you do the hybridization of that is actually also a challenge that is, you know, I'll leave it to better minds and, and the researchers like, like David or, or Tom to, to do so. But uh, there is, there is uh, so much work still to be done to understand better how things work and what is, what is good and, and what is not for people. But there is also a number of possibilities that are opened up by the, just the simple fact that we have the technology already working in our device in the HoloLens and, and other devices like that. Yeah. Oh, there's a question yeah, from the audience. Yeah. We have the question here from the audience. How much the different HoloLens at the different Magic Leap devices weigh? The first one, the second one. You mentioned how many percent it is lighter, but do you have a value? <laughs> I have to check with my, with All my right. lawyers to see. <laughs> no, no, actually, check. Actually, Online. I'm, I'm, Thank you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, the Magic Leap one weighs at around 350 grams or so on your head. Uh, just a headpiece, right? I mean, the computer is, I don't remember, but it's not as important. Um, the, the Magic Leap 2 is going to weigh uh, significantly less than that. Like I said, about 20% lighter. So it is very light on the head. I tried it out in the AW mm -hmm. recently. It is very light on the head. Yeah. Um, I have one question, and you mentioned it already. You also mentioned the whole lens in the end, and there is a question here from the audience as well in the chat about the U.S. Army IVAS. Martin, so are you we are working with the U.S. Navy. We have U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Army has this huge contract with, with Microsoft for about $10 billion where they are planning to really equip all the soldiers with the augmented reality displays. Does that influence your work? Are you somehow involved in the IVAS usage or is, does it somehow affect you? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, the, the Army IVAS project is, is a little bit different. Uh, we in the Navy, we, we have not been involved with the IVAS project yet, although I, I can see some, some great application for, in, in the medical setting for something like the IVAS project. Um, one of the sort of big uh, challenges that we'll, we'll, we'll see in, you know, future conflicts is uh, something called you know, uh, going to conflict with a, a near peer competitor. Um, and the implication of that um, to trauma medicine and combat medicine is, is basically air superiority and our ability to medevac people. Um, one of the reasons we're successful in delivering trauma care is because we can easily fly somebody who is injured on the field to 
a surgical capable um, location within an hour or so. Um, and they would get great medical care and then from there be shipped to, to Germany and back home all within a couple of days. If we can't secure air superiority, that is going to be very difficult. Um, and in order to sort of get around that challenge, one of the big things the medical community is trying to do is push expertise forward. Well, there's only so many of us around in the United States Navy and Army and Air Force. Um, as you saw, there's only about 230 surgeons and we all can't deploy all the time to every single location. So how do we push that medical expertise out there? One of the ways that I can see the IBIS uh, technology being used is to, to do exactly that, right? If one person can use this, this goggle and actually um, be able to see what they're, what they're looking at downrange, like if you had a general surgeon who's able to see a, a, um, a, an injured soldier or Marine or sailor downrange, um, that may require sort of more expert care than he's able to, to provide. Maybe he can put on this, this IVIS lens and somebody on the other side, maybe somebody sitting here in San Diego could put the same goggles on and be able to see what that person is seeing and sort of transfer that expertise over to him and guide him through some of the, uh, some of the procedures he needs to do. Uh, I mean, that's, that's sort of long range, 10, 20 years down the road, but it is something that, that is possible. I mean, there are, there are things that we have to get over, like um, we need connectivity to, to the far reaches of the world and satellite technology will definitely help with that. Um, but that's, that's a great application that we can, that we can use in, in sort of wartime scenarios. Um, as an educator, having something like that and being able to see uh, what your trainees are seeing when they do certain procedures and certain things is also great too, because you can sort of get in their head a little bit and, and be able to, to understand maybe certain challenges with, uh, with teaching certain procedures. Um, and Albert, you can probably talk to that too, right? Sometimes when you're putting in a central line with a brand new CA1, for example, it's hard to figure out what they're try what they're looking at, and what they're concentrating on, and whether it's what you want them to focus on and try to guide them along. So, um, having this this IVIS technology may actually be useful for that as well. Over. So that's an interesting point you made, and this is also something I think Albert, you mentioned in one of your slides that this is. It's a bit, still a bit tricky, but it's very important, the multiplayer aspect. For example, that an instructor sees what a student, a student is seeing. How important is it? How important and what does the multiplayer aspect contribute? Also, perhaps I think there's an audience question. If you have multiple people, not all together at the same location, but distributed over different locations in the world. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. So I think uh, Tom can also chime in as well because he's done um, a preliminary study where he has put different players in remote locations, and uh, you know there's technological kind of challenges that we're still working out, as you can imagine. But the general concept of that is instead of seeing player A, player B, player C all in the same physical space because they're not in the same place. Uh, they're replaced by avatars. So instead of seeing Tom's face, for inst instance, if I'm sitting at home and he's sitting at his house, I will see his avatar in the headset instead of his actual body. Um, and that is one of the, I think, you know, right now, distance, socially distant, every, anything is all the rage right now. So this is potential uh, a potential application for this. And it's not just for... Uh, socially distant learning, right? Because you can have people are more used to working from home now. There's more flexibility in their work hours. It's not the traditional everybody show up to work to the hospital and we all hang out and do some simulations together. People have different work schedules. Uh, so the flexibility of this system is uh, something that we can potentially explore further to uh, still satisfy their educational needs. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, <clears throat> when we originally uh, went into this uh, software development, the idea was creating a mixed reality um, scenario where we would have um, holographic assets that were augmenting the world in which we we're living. Um, so perhaps if you don't have a defibrillator, you could use a holographic defibrillator, but you might still use the ventilator that happened to be in the room. And then COVID happened. 
And one background functionality was the multiplayer at, um, option that we then ratcheted up to the to the front of the line in terms of production. And we created, uh, spent, it was actually a little tricky, but we, we figured it out. And so now in our first uh, feasibility study, we had medical students all in the safety of their own homes um, scattered across Palo Alto and Menlo Park and Stanford and all in the same simulation environment. So the advantages of that was that they were learning remotely. We've done this with uh, colleagues on the other side of the world just to sh when we're sort of showing them how awesome the software is. Um, the advantage is that people are in their own homes. These could be deployed in uh, limited resource settings if they had access to them, while the instructor can remain um, you know, in their setting without having to go there. But the downside is that we're um, the lack of tactile of, of feel. So we're somewhat limited to non-technical skills, uh, communication skills, as participants are gathered around holographic assets in their own space. Um, so it's a little bit of a different, different idea than traditional simulation where you may have that tactile feel. It's also a little different from traditional simulation in the fact that you can't make eye contact with the participants because you will see an avatar, a holographic avatar, that participant. Um, in the future, I imagine we'll be able to sort of do like a facial scan or something. And then that avatar will be actually your, your avatar like head. So it'll look like Albert instead of a floating balloon right now. Um, that's uh, probably not too far off. Um, but it's, it does have a server purpose. Uh, we're currently just on the cusp of starting a multi-site study with some of the top hospitals in the country where um, we're going to have pediatric anesthesia fellows all training remotely in one common simulation to try to identify differences in uh, communication skills and how uh, people um, approach similar um, scenarios that may occur in the operating rooms to see if there's regional, geographical, ethnic differences um, without, have, um, without having to actually bring all these people together in the same space. Thank you very much. We also, um, it's already after 10, we also, we also, of course, opened the question to the audience. And I think we already have one question from Bruce. Yeah, I was just going to say, does the microphone work here? Yes, it works, but perhaps okay. you can also come up here, then people see you okay. online. Okay, I was going that to might say be useful. whether we have some, uh, just going to ask if people in the audience had questions. Maybe I can uh, be the roving reporter and go around with my microphone. Who has a question here? So please introduce yourself and then uh, your question. Sure. Uh, ben Ambastani from uh, Meta Facebook. Um, question is, uh, uh, we talk about a lot of uh, holographic uh, training, um, uh, but we also alluded like we could have other sensory uh, devices on this uh, wearables to measure health applications. Uh, if you had a choice to top two or three of the sensing devices, uh, what would have been uh, for your application? All right, who wants to answer that question? So did you understand the question online? So the question is, if you use sensory devices on your headset and using a sensory device in order to assess uh, the person using the mixed reality device, um, how you can use them and how you would like to use them. This is perhaps oh. uh, Martin with your students or David, you. Um, Albert wants to know if his students are sweating or not. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, one of the things that's been uh, looked at a little bit over the years is uh, measuring uh, heart rate variability and uh, and the Fourier transform of of that um, as markers of uh, stress. Um, and so that would be one thing from the standpoint of using such technologies in in the educational or uh, investigative kind of arena of research on decision making and effects of stress and so forth and, and the environmental kinds of issues that uh, Martin brings up that are unique. Fortunately, most of us don't face those environmental challenges. Yeah, I, I think being able to measure some of those uh, physio physiological parameters in some of our providers may give sort of an insight from the investigative side just to uh, one, to see if uh, frequent simulations um, 
does help with that and do you know do physiological changes in in the providers um, decrease with more and more simulations and um, and to what extent like how many simulations do we need to do to uh, to, to deem somebody sort of ready to go um, that would be sort of an interesting um, look I suppose or use of it uh, ben, to your to to heart rate variability, yeah, I'd add skin conductance and pupillary dilation. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but uh, you know, I can dream. Right now, we uh, use skin, skin conductance levels and heart rate variabilities using you know other sensors like biopacks. Um, so the technology's out there. I'm just not sure when it can be integrated. Can I chime in if you don't mind? Um, I do know, for example, that Tom. Was already used uh, eye tracking for knowing where people are looking. Uh, there's even a paper or two published about it. So there is plenty of things you can do with the eyes, and people dilation should not be too far off. Just so you know, Tom. Um, in, in more in general, uh, I think there is a there's a lot of. I mean, in the end, it depends on on of course some 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 cost versus benefit um, analysis as well. But you can certainly use a number of sensors on device already to measure a number of different things on, on the user. Pupil dilation is actually one of them as well as their eye movements more generally and where they're fixating or looking. You can also measure their movement more general in general because you know an augmented reality device actually has to track you in the world. So those two are exist already essentially. There, there are efforts, certainly research efforts in different places for, for a number of other um, conditions that could be potentially measured either through the sensors on device or by attaching sensors externally. I mean, like EDA sensors or, or heart rate variability sensors, et cetera. So, so I think the possibilities are, are wide. More just, questions from the, uh, more questions from the audience. Or Albert, do you have a I just wanna chime in real quick, um, just to kind of uh, piggyback off Patrick's comment. So with the eye tracking, what we were able to do is actually uh, with our subjects, we were able to quantify the latency and the duration of um, of them staring at something. So, for instance, we found that uh, attendings who are much more well trained in terms of managing these crisis situations tended to focus on something much faster uh, than the trainees, and they actually look at it, and they actually don't spend as much time look staring at a vital sign change as opposed to the trainees. And you know what that actually means, we still have to parse out, but that is one advantage of this technology is you can actually um, calculate what they're seeing, how long they're looking at something, and then potentially uh, trend it over time as their training increases and to see if there's any change in that behavior. All right, more questions? My name is Benjamin Downs. I'm with a company called MetaView. Uh, we're based out of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we're an augmented reality uh, company that works with ultrasound, MRI, CT. Um, I met Brian last week at the uh, RSNA in Chicago. He invited me up here. So my question is to Patrick. Uh, you mentioned a few different companies, Brain Lab and, and a couple more. Are you currently looking for more companies like ours to work with? Um, we want to be agnostic to bring uh, democratization of medicine across the world. So uh, we're currently working with the HoloLens and with GE Ultrasound, but our goal is to work with every company, both uh, hardware and ultrasound based. So thanks, Patrick. So trying to keep this as technical as possible. Um, sure. We've, we've had actually contact with you guys uh, uh, before, so um, I'm happy to, to have a contact directly if, if, you, if you so desire. More generally, yes, we are. I mean, we, we are, uh, as Magically, we are a developer for a platform and we welcome as many applications as possible. Um, and uh, every partner I show, including Tom and, and, and Oliver there, doesn't mean that it's exclusive to just these, 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 uh, these companies or institutions. We've worked and we are continuing to work with many others in, in similar fields and others for, for different applications. So sure, Benjamin, I'm happy to connect um, if you if you want to contact me later. And then uh, another question here from Chad. Hi, I'm Chad Houston. I work with Schlumberger in the industry in energy industry. I just want to follow up uh, on the comment you made at the beginning, where you're talking about the value of 
haptics, if it could be, you know, added or integrated to the, the simulation. And you mentioned that was a previous panel, but is there anything going on, any research or whatever, of say combining haptic gloves with an augmented reality headset to give some feedback while you're looking at something, doing something? So perhaps I comment on that, sorry. First of all, I should probably tell everybody that we have all the recordings from the previous panels online on our SMMR page that also you've uh, reached through the flyer. And the last one was about the haptics where they talked about gloves that you can use. So gloves that you put on that give you um, force feedback. Recently at the ADRWE in Santa Clara, there was a big exposition where they showed different haptics devices. So there's a lot of research going on. I'm not sure whether there's research. There is some research. Actually, we have a student who is working at Jasmine with mechanical engineering, working on a device that gives you some sort of vibration feedback if you touch um, different virtual renderings using the whole lens. And then there's, yeah, there are whole labs in Stanford that are working on this um, feedback, on haptic feedback. So they connect with the AR headset. They connect with the AR headset, yeah. Um, I, we are very, um, uh, we're going in that direction, but we're not there yet. Some very rudimentary things that we've integrated is feeling the pulse uh, pressure. We're using the controller, the Magic Leap controller that you hold, and if you hold it over the carotid, uh, depending upon if the instructor has set a weak pulse or strong pulse, you'll get that feedback. It's the same sort of concept. We have, um, you can auscultate the lungs, the heart, the abdomen by using a um, holographic stethoscope. So then you can start to hear different breath sounds. But the next iteration, next step is to go to the level of like, okay, instead of using the controller, can we use the glove? But we're somewhat limited by the fact that participants need the controllers to be utilizing the experience. And so how, you know, the hands are the natural place for haptics to enter the body. And it's uh, challenging to integrate those haptics it, with a participant who's also kind of stuck using a controller. Thank you very much. I have one last question. So one last question that came to mind when you talked about the medical simulation, the remote aspect that allows a teacher to remotely teach a student. So we had a student uh, this summer, Phyllis Odor. She is currently studying in Amherst, but she was doing a project with Kenya. And the motivation behind it is that medical mixed reality or mixed reality in general doesn't require a lot of infrastructure. You need a device. And perhaps if it's this device is LTE or some connectivity, you need like the sending mask once in a while, but you don't need a cooling chain. You don't need great streets. You don't need all this infrastructure that comes with a, like a medical school somewhere. So she was looking into aspects, so can we perhaps use mixed reality as an important technology to teach medical skills in developing countries? Any final comments from you, whether is this viable, is this way too expensive, or is this potentially like a very useful field in the future? I'll leave the questions up to anybody uh, in the panel if you want to comment on that. All right, I'll just go very quickly. Um, you know, right now with the software we're working with, like I had mentioned, it's mostly holographic in nature. So for developing technical skills, um, I think that there may be some applicability there, but we're a little bit far off on the integration of the holographic nature of the software in a limited resource setting. Um, that setting would have to be pretty well equipped um, to add that technical aspect to it. Um, but that's just from my perspective. I'm sure you guys on the panel may have other thoughts. Well, I, I think there already are potential applications with just cell phone technology because there's a lot of kinds of simulation that don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, fully immersive or, um, you know, verbal simulation I mentioned in, in the spectrum <clears throat> can be done uh, that way and and verbal simulation can be enhanced. Uh, there's an app for the iPhone called uh, Simmon, which puts up a monitor display from like an operating room or ICU and and one person's you know phone can control the the values and waveforms on the other one. And it's very cheap app for at least cheap for our purposes, it's like 25 or 50 dollars. Um, 
And it allows the instructor then to have a verbal simulation that's enhanced by some of the, the key variables that in certain kinds of clinical settings are really important. And that's pretty low technology, but it's a, a pretty useful thing for a lot of purposes. Thank you very much. So we are like one minute over time. I want to give everybody one last sentence, Chris like talks. your main um, outlook or motivation. Can we take maybe, maybe see if there's one good question from the online community, from the people watching virtually on the chat? Yes, yeah, there actually, let's, we can just quickly go through there. I'll look through that and this will be the very last question, but beforehand, yeah. I'll or give everybody of you like one last statement where you think this will be where the field will be in 10 years. What will the medical simulation look like in 10 years? Um, in 10 years, uh, medical simulation, uh, like Dr. Gabo was saying, I, I don't think that um, these technologies are replacements. I think that in the spectrum of educational tools and devices, um, XR technologies, mixed realities um, will be an option when you're doing medical simulation. Um, traditional in-person simulation will definitely still exist. Um, in situ simulations will definitely still exist with physical assets, um, but utilizing some of these technical uh, simul uh, technical advances will provide additional teaching adjuncts um, for educators. Um, and I I don't a lot of people want to move towards a, a kind of a self contained system where you put on the headset and the user goes and they're kind of on their own. Uh, and I think it's maybe a personal bias as an educator myself, but I. I believe that keeping a person, a human educator as a component of the simulation experience um, and using technology as a tool, not as a replacement, um, is the direction we ought to be moving in. Yeah, what he said, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing that I am excited about is increasing access to the frequency at which we can do these simulations. So, a lot of the trainees that I work with, they love doing simulations. They think it's very high yield. Um, however, there's uh, limitations to how often we can pull them out of work to do these things. And it's a balance between you know, education and clinical service needs of the hospital. So if we have another avenue to provide these learning experiences that may be easier to implement uh, on a, uh, more frequently, then I think that's going to be advantageous for um, for learners in general. Thank you, then David. Uh, what all they what what they said, plus, uh, I think 10 years from now, it's all going to be simultaneously very different and very much the same. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Patrick. Sure. Uh... Well, first, I did want to say one thing, right? It is, it was a bit tricky to implement the the, the communications in the in the M01 for Tom and group, but uh, things are getting easier, and that is part of where where you where you think of in the future as well. More connectivity, um, more seamless uh, interaction with the device, a lot of more tools for the devices and for the for the you know for the apps as a whole. Um, but I also agree, right? It's it's still going to be the same. You're still going to have to work with uh, with cadavers or with sim with you know mannequins and with purely virtual. So it'll be more and also the same, uh, but augmented and, and hopefully also as as a as a as an industry in general, in you know with be a better idea of what works better for what, right? And that, that's what I think you'll see in the next ten years. Thank you, and Martin. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do agree with uh, what has been said. Um, there is a role for sort of virtual reality and augmented reality in medical simulation. Um, it is great for knowledge obtainment, for even training uh, medical decision making. Um, and as somebody actually mentioned in the chat, it allows the participant to um, do things over and over again without and fail multiple times without, you know, fear of, of really hurting someone. I think that's that's a great benefit. Uh, but at the same time, there's also the, the need to actually be able to touch something and do something. Um, we talked about you know, getting a Belmont or a rapid infuser. You can talk 
through it as much as you want. It is different when you have to put it together. And it's different when you have to put it together when someone is dying and you need to do it very, very quickly. Um, I've seen a lot of blood being spilled on the ground doing so. Um, and I, I think there's still a role for, for that part of it too. Thank you very much. And I have a perfect last question here from Cindy Wang in the chat. And that is in, if we um, talk about this technology and um, how it works, what works well, what doesn't work so well, in the end, it is important that we are actually also able to use it. So her question is, aside from cost, are there any major blockers for educational institutions in adopting our technology? So who are the decision, key decision makers to invest in this technology? So what, what do we need? What is, is the main thing that prevents all of our students here right now learning using medical simulations? Well, we, beyond cost, I will tell you that one of our qualitative studies uh, sort of started to drive at, at that exact question. Um, and when placing these devices on students and trainees, what you find is that there's, a, we call it a technologically a technological learning curve. So although these are consumer devices, they're not widely held by consumers. And if I were to hand um, a typical student a Magic Leap or a HoloLens or whatever it might be, there's going to be this moment where they're sort of looking at it, wondering how does this work and what do I do? Um, and so because of that, you need to have an instructor right there by their side to sort of walk them through how to get set up, how to get hooked up to the Wi-Fi. I think we're hooked up, but I can't hear anybody. Um, I can hear you, but um, my, my bed is backwards compared to everyone else's. We need to anchor the bed. So there's all these little things that for our team, we've become very facile at it. And sometimes we get um, a little bit too far removed and you hand it to a common uh, student and they're like, I, I, I'm just not interested in this. So I think the technological learning curve is probably one of the, one of the biggest um, barriers to full-scale adoption right now, um, assuming costs were all the same and we could magically make uh, headsets fall, fall in the lap of everyone right now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending the panel, for the guests to um, present in such an interesting manner about medical mixed reality simulations. Now, for everybody online, you, like Bruce mentioned in the beginning, we'll have somebody with a Zoom connected device walking around showing a bit of the demos. For everybody here in the room, you'll have the chance to eat first while we are like building up the posters. And then I also want to um, Give the word to Bruce. Bruce, if you perhaps want to stand here in the middle. Okay. You also want to say, oh, oh I can spotlight you then if you have something to, to read. I, I just uh, wanted, I'll introduce myself. I'm Bruce Daniel. I'm uh, so, uh, Bruce Daniel. I'm um, one of the co-directors of the Immerse Lab, but I want to congratulate Christoph and all of you on a wonderful panel discussion. Maybe we can clap for just a second here. <laughs> I, I think um, we all learned a tremendous amount. I also would like to thank, uh, especially Christoph, for pulling the whole SMR MLR group that has kind of tried to create a community at Stanford Center around many of these topics and the previous forums that you've heard about in symposia. I want to thank Jocelyn and Lily uh, and uh, the team who put together some of our uh, logistics for today and food that you can all enjoy, those of you who are here in a, in a couple of minutes right outside. Um, after we're done with the food for about 15 minutes, we'll have some demonstrations. So you're welcome to come back in the room here. Um, the, the labs, these are all from participating labs here at Stanford. Many of these are work in progress. They're not polished corporate demos. So uh, please bear with everyone as we're trying to get set up and things, you know, we have the work or they won't work. That's how it always is, right? But um, we'd love to have your feedback. Uh, the participating labs include the 3DQ lab, uh, which does um, 3D um, um, rendering of, of medical imaging data primarily and measurements. Uh, from mechanical engineering, the ARM lab, we have Shivani here. From the Immerse lab, we have Serena here. Uh, from the Chariot lab, hopefully Tom and Albert have the, the demo of their uh, software, I believe. Um, Nick Blevins here fr from the Cardinal Sim lab. I think he and Tricia have a, a demo as well. The Wusai Visualization Community Lab in this very building right downstairs. Uh, Christoph's uh, lab has also uh, Wally and Emmanuel who are here. And then uh, finally, we had a RAD 206 course that this is the sort of capstone day for all of them. They're here. And we have six different groups, Jasmine, Godson, and Maddie. Kevin and Wayne together, Rachel and Laura, and many of the topics you've all been thinking about, whether it's simulation with haptics or, or whether it's um, audio feedback for your 
transcranial magnetic stimulation task, or can we improve um, uh, rehabilitation? Um, can we guide a procedure uh, with a very high fidelity mixed reality? Um, can, can we use uh, can we provide uh, interfaces for disabled people to use uh, uh, um, medical systems? So th there's lots of different uh, things which we, we can come and we'd love to have your discussions. That's the main thing. So thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, we're really excited that we were able to do at least part of this. And I'd also want to thank all of our wonderful guests from uh, from all around the country who've joined us to present as well as to be part of the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much.